July the 31st, it was a beautiful day in Chicago in the summertime, and I said, man, this place is great compared to the hot summers in Memphis. The weather here is just beautiful. Not knowing anything about what it was like in January, but I was thinking, this is gorgeous. So it was a beautiful day. I went down to the Board of Trade on August the 1st, 1977, and got a, a job as a runner. And the floors at that time uh, were mostly agricultural dominated. The grain floor at the Board of Trade was the uh, where all the activity was and where everybody wanted to, asp everybody aspired to be in the soybean pit or the corn pit or one of the big ag markets. And um, I, however, had a couple of friends from Memphis who were involved in the financial instruments at the Board of Trade, which was at the time Jenny May. So they had opened uh, futures, and Leo Malala had been the leader over at the Mercantile Exchange to open futures on uh, FX. And T-Bills and the Board of Trade had opened Jenny Mays, and about three weeks after the um, day that I arrived, uh, the Board of Trade opened. It was hugely exciting. They opened futures on Treasury bonds led by Richard Sander at the Board of Trade. And, um, and so the financial instruments was where my buddy said, this is where the future is going to be. Is in, they're going to trade futures on money, and they're going to be able to trade futures on rates and maybe even someday they'll trade options like they trade today on stocks. They only traded options on stocks at the time they created the Chicago Board Options Exchange just a few years before. And so when I arrived, there were of course no cell phones. There were of course uh, no turnstiles or any sort of security to go walking onto the trading floor. There were people that could, you could smoke, you couldn't smoke in the pits, which people were still complaining about. You could only smoke in the, over in the corners and in the bathrooms. Uh, there, the, the books and records of the companies were all done by pen in a, in a general ledger. But there were no computerized ledgers for the back offices. And the trades were handed to a key punch operator who key punched them into a stack of cards. And you took this stack of cards. One of the, my first jobs was to take the stack of cards over to the Board of Trade Clearing Corporation on the 14th floor and deliver them to the window, and they would take the trades and to the back and run them through the computer at night to match all the buys and sells of the computers. And then in the mornings, it, in, in the, late in the afternoon, it would spit out a list of uh, the trades that didn't match for whatever reason, and then you cleared those up in the afternoons and then uh, again in the morning. And, and the people that reconciled all those trades, the clerical jobs, were called trade checkers. So I got a job as a runner, and not long after that, I got a job as a trade checker. And slowly but surely, I watched the technologies along the way develop. And uh, in, I became a, they had a permit program for people that were new and they wanted to try to build the population in the treasury bond and treasury note pits where they had this uh, competition going with the CME, the Board of Trade did, to try to build treasury futures. And so I got a permit and then I made enough money to buy a seat and I eventually gave up my, my job in the afternoon and the morning and I went to a new clearing firm where I was clearing my trades, and these guys were getting ready. They were ag guys, and they said uh, they wanted a big new push into the financial markets where all the volume was growing. And um, they made this big push, and I said, you guys aren't ready for this in the back office. Any of you would have told them the same thing. This was not rocket science. I could just tell from working in the back office they weren't ready, and they were like, oh, we know how to do this. We come from the grain market. So okay. So uh, three days into the new year, they were out of balance and had all this problem. The guy ran the firm and said, Chris, would you help us do this? We stayed up all night long with a list of all the trades and went through every single trade to try to make sure it matched, figured out where they were. They got out the next day. It cost them 10% of their capital. And the guy who uh, ran Virginia Trading Corporation said, I'm very grateful. Would you buy into the firm? I'd like you to buy out the guy that was running it. I said, I don't have enough money. We went over to the Continental Bank. And he co-signed a loan with me, and I bought into the firm. We sold that two years later. Um, and then one of the partners is a guy named Ralph Goldenberg. And Ralph Goldenberg said, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know, back to the floor. He said, I think we should start our own firm called Goldenberg Haymire and Company. This was in 1985. And that was an FCM. How many of you all know what an 
FCM is. So a little more than half of you. It's a futures commission merchant. A futures commission merchant um, is the federal law designation of a company that is licensed to hold customer money. So a futures commission merchant um, has all kinds of uh, rules and regulations surrounding the holding of a customer's money. An introducing broker can introduce business and get paid on a commission basis, but an introducing broker cannot hold customer money. And so we got our license as a futures commission merchant, and we had uh, everything we owned up on the line every day. It was a general partnership. At the time, people said, you should not have a general partnership. As you guys probably know, corporations have limited liability. But we had a few companies that said, you guys are too little, we won't do business with you. And we said, we're a general partnership. And the guy said, so your personal assets are on the line every day? And we said, yes. And these guys said, okay, we'll do business with you. So we had uh, a smattering of ag business and a bunch of locals. And in the late 80s, the technologies really started to change. We saw the uh, advent of computers. The first time I saw an, a Mac to draw a picture, all the charts, all the charts, a day chart of the price of soybeans were all done on graphing paper with a sharp pencil, with a mechanical pencil, that's how graphs were done. First time I saw a Mac II draw a chart, a daily chart of soybeans, it was like, whoa, God, it was, it was amazing that this thing would draw a chart. First time I saw a window, you had to type things in to make it do things in the first computers in 1980. And, and, and then, of course, the computers really started to develop where we were able to uh, manage the books with spreadsheets. Spreadsheets, first time I ever heard that word. It was like 10 years after I'd been in the business. And then, of course, cell phones. Cell phones became ubiquitous. Now, of course, uh, and then we got, um, then, of course, electronic trading started in the early 1990s, and we started a proprietary trading business in the, what we call the off hours. Of course, globally, there's no real off hour, but um, we were all sort of focused still in the United States because the only thought of the, mor the hours really of morning till afternoon in the United States. And so we saw the, um, the markets really become a lot more global. And, um, and then the technology started to take over with, with the um, electronic trading, right, and the, and the exchanges competing, Globex, and of course the clearing thing uh, really started to change, when the, particularly when the Board of Trade uh, moved all of its clearing business to CME, and then the exchanges were demutualized. They, the members needed, particularly the floor, the floor brokers who uh, made their livings by uh, being in between, they were brokering trades on the floor. They were going to be disintermediated by the technology because a person from Australia could trade with a person from England without anybody in between except the machine. So um, there were these fabulous advancements in the, in the clearing and these uh, ways to value the businesses and extract value for, and then other investors could get involved. And then uh, businesses like Trading Technologies and uh, PATS came along and were able to provide uh, access to investors around the world. We sold the FCM and kept a proprietary trading business, which is what, which is HTG Capital today. So that's a proprietary trading business. I'm still involved with KCG Futures, which is the old Goldenberg Haymire and Company uh, futures company. So a lot of those people are people that I, I've worked with through the years. It was the old company that we owned and ran. What I really like to come and tell people about is um, the way the technologies are changing going forward. And, and it's a little breathtaking. Um, there's a guy named Ray Kurzweil, who's a futurist, people call him the futurist, and you all may know of his books, The Age of the Intelligent Machine, which he wrote in the early 90s, that did nothing but really extrapolate Moore's law and the way that technologies are advancing. It's not really, he's not really predicting the future, he's just sort of taking the technologies and showing where it will go. And he wrote a book in the early 2000s called Age of the Spiritual Machine, um, which he, he actually, um, predicts that, that machines will have spiritual experiences that will be believable in about 25 years. And so um, he wrote The Singularity, which discusses the way a lot of, uh, there's a couple of TED Talks that I highly recommend if you go to TED Talks and, and look up Ray Kurzweil that I highly recommend to you because it will change your perspective of the way any businesses, the whole world is advancing, but particularly ours. Because ours 
is so dependent on high performance um, computer technologies, the connectivity and the ability of processing these massive amounts of trades quickly. So our, our industry is so dependent on, the, on, on these technologies um, that the advances in them show up in our businesses. And so what's important, if you're interested in this business going forward, is to keep all of this in, the, in context and in mind. So he predicts, and again, this is just extrapolating it out, in five to 10 years, today your phone is able to, um, if you do a Google search, it may pause for a moment and use what it's got in its phone, and then it can go to supercomputer pretty fast and access, the search engines can access 10,000 other computers to find an, an answer for something. It already, Watson, for instance, in uh, Jeopardy, is, is able to answer questions much faster than the humans because it's read Wikipedia, it's read all the papers, it's read research papers. And so uh, Watson can very quickly analyze massive amounts of data and come up with an answer because it can read the information and start to process it much faster than humans can. And we've witnessed in our um, history and experience of these exchanges how fast and how powerful the machines are and how they can process trade. Well, it's the same thing, of course, in search engines. In, in five to 10 years, the, the machines will be very capable of thinking and telling you what you might think about, right? So, uh, and we already see a little bit of that in, in, in uh, walking down the street, the Groupon will pop up and say, in that store, they've got a fabulous deal on getting your nails done. And I know you like your nails done over at Pinkies, but if you use Rosie's today, it's only $12. And so it will start, all of these machines are gonna start to think for you and start to give you information. It's only 20 years away, and I'm gonna go back for just one sec, the, the, the 200 million years ago is when uh, mammals first had a cortex, which was the part of our brain that can actually think and recognize things and do something differently because I went down that way and my mother was killed, so I'm gonna go chase animals this way. It's where it just starts to think. Um, after the, uh, you know, the event 65 million years ago, the Cretaceous event when all the dinosaurs were killed, mammals really accelerated after that in this development of their brain. And about two million years ago is when humans developed the big forehead that uh, chimpanzees and other apes don't have. We developed this, this frontal cortex where we took a quantum leap and able to think and rationalize. Well, it's 20 years from now, if you do the technologies, where human beings and digital technologies start to merge and Kurzweil feels very strongly that there will be a gigantic quantum leap in our brains and the ability to communicate with the digital technologies. It's kind of hard to think about, but um, when we think about what pricing we've seen with the price of soybeans to be determined in a pit of guys standing around yelling at each other, and it was guys when I arrived there, there weren't even women. Um, today, uh, a lot of these things are getting priced, uh, uh, you know, commodities, financial instruments, credit for companies, all this stuff gets priced on machines. Well, the machines, um, are very capable of starting to price various segments of the various things that go into a value chain. So um, if you've got a, uh, uh, an organic apples, and those organic apples start to go down in, in quantity, and you guys know supply and demand, the price of that will start to rise. And whether it's uh, locally in Chicago or nationally, the ability to price things locally and to price organic apples at the farm and with the transportation and with what it, the margin is at Whole Foods, you can, the, the ability to price these things all the way through the value chain will become much more transparent. And you'll be able to follow prices of things in the value chain all the way along the way on your phone. All of this information can become transparent, accessible, and tradable, as you guys probably have been told more times than you care to hear while you've been in your internships that the futures and options exchanges and the futures and options system is a giant risk transfer system, not a capital raising system like a stock exchange where a company issues stock to try to raise capital. This is about risk transfer. So people are trying to get rid of the risk of the price of something. Maybe it's the 
the price of soybeans. They own soybeans. It's a farmer who produces soybeans, so he has the risk that the price of soybeans could go down. Or a baker that's going to need wheat, he's got the risk that the price of the wheat could go up. So he wants to mitigate or to hedge that risk by buying ahead so that he knows what his price is. Others might be trying to assume that price risk, of course, by a fund of money that says, I want the risk of the price of wheat going up. I'd like to buy wheat futures. And then you get people that make markets in between. So, and the people that facilitate all that business. And so it's a giant risk transfer system. So I feel that what you guys, those of you who will continue to be interested in our industry, that you stand in a place that, um, that has the chance of um, breathtaking advances in the technologies um, and the ability to do fantastic things, to price things that, the ways that they've never been priced before with transparency so that lots of people can see lots of pricing in lots of places and lots of ways that they never dreamed of before. And so, um, you know, sometimes I think to myself, uh, yeah, 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 everybody says there's always a great time to be in the industry. It's always a fascinating time to be in the industry because I've been in it for so long. People say that all the time. But the good news about that is the technologies are changing so fast that you can always jump into whatever's next because tomorrow, it's right now in our shop, we talk about FPGA cards and whether the C++ is a lot faster than Java, even if you get rid of the garbage collection problem for all you guys that are programmers. So, um, but all of those things are gonna always be advancing and so if you like this business and you like the industry and I like these guys, love it, I love the people in it, I love the challenge of it. Um, and so if you like it, there's, I'll, I'll tell one last story, it's not for everybody and as interns, you hear a lot of, uh, a lot of things from people, oh my gosh, you ought to be in this industry, it's so exciting and uh, lately the last couple of years it, with rates not moving much and the stock market volatility being low, it's not been the most exciting place to be. People are going to a lot of other places, but people still find the industry uh, really exciting. But uh, at the Board of Trade, uh, which is now, of course, where all of the trading floors are, the Merck moved all of the physical trading over to the Board of Trade building. And those of you who have seen it, the, the ag floor doesn't have any windows on it. Either floor has any windows on it. But the ag floor is where this happened. There was a guy from uh, Moon Lake, Mississippi, not far from where I grew up. And he was a great uh, outdoorsman, he loved to hunt and fish and be outside all the time and see the sunrise and see the ducks fly over at sunrise. He loved being outside and all of his friends were going to Chicago to get a job on the floor of the exchange. It was the thing to be doing. And so his dad being was a farmer and had a trading account, helped get him a job as a runner and so he loaded up his truck and he had a couple of roommates and guys that he knew from Mississippi and he loaded up his stuff and he got in his truck and he drove all the way up I-57 from Memphis, into the back of the Board of Trade, back there in one of those parking lots. Parked his truck, went in, went up there to the visitor center, and looked down on that trading floor with no windows and all those people shouting and all that uh, trash on the floor. And he went and he got back in his truck and he drove back to Mississippi. He said, that's not for me. He said, that's all for those guys, but that's not for me. And one of the things that you should do, I would encourage you to always do, is, is to pursue what makes your own oven burn. Side. If it's not for you, you've learned what not to do. And if, if it really catches your spirit like it did for me the day I walked on that floor 37 years ago, tomorrow actually, the 1st of August, um, if that's what you love, there are going to be good days and bad days, and you want to try and pursue something that even on the bad days you can make your way through. Thank you, John.